And today I want to talk about fusion, but in particular cold fusion. In my previous video, um, I was talking about uh, nuclear fission and fission reactors, and a couple of people uh, mentioned that perhaps we could use um, cold fusion in order to solve all of our energy needs. Well, I, I had some things that I wanted to say about that. But um, it was quite substantial, so I thought, eh, you know, maybe I'll just make a video about it. So, um, in order to understand cold fusion, we first have to understand fusion. And I also, also want to talk about electrolysis. So, what is nuclear fusion? Well, nuclear fusion is the exact opposite of fission. Instead of splitting a heavy atom into two smaller atoms, as, as in the case with fission, and you use a a neutron to do it to bombard nucleus. In fusion, you're joining two lighter atoms together into one heavier atom. And then when you join them together, it releases energy, and that's where uh, the fusion energy, that's how it's released. It's just the exact opposite. Um, but where's that energy coming from? Well, it comes from something called the strong nuclear force. Now, normally in the, the nucleus of an atom, you have protons and neutrons joined together. Now, you might have wondered to yourself, how is it that all those particles are staying at the nucleus of an atom? What's keeping them there? I mean, we all know about the electromagnetic force, and we all know that like charges like to repel each other. So you have, all, you have protons in the nucleus of an atom. They're all positively charged. What's keeping them there with the neutrons? Well, it turns out there, there's another force. It's called the strong nuclear force. And that's what's holding the nucleus together. It also holds the particles themselves together because those particles are made out of quarks. But we won't get into that. Um, just suffice to say, the strong nuclear force is an attractive force and it's much stronger than the electromagnetic repulsion of the like charges of the protons in the nucleus of an atom. But the range is limited. It has a much shorter range than the electromagnetic force. The electromagnetic force's range is um, potentially infinite. The more, like, the more charges you have, the, the greater the electromagnetic force. So for example, um, the uh, electromagnetic force in carbon, which has more protons in its nucleus than hydrogen, has a greater uh, electromagnetic repulsion than hydrogen does. But if you were to squeeze two hydrogen atoms close enough together, at first the, the, the nuclei will repel each other because of the like charges, but if you get them close enough to the point of where they're coming into range of the strong nuclear force, then they will snap together. And then they are, are then they fuse and then that releases tremendous amounts of energy. And that's how fusion happens. So how do you get them, get them that close together? Well, normally you need intense heat or pressure, and this happens at the core of our sun. Now, it turns out that the heat and pressure in the core of our sun is actually not sufficient to get them to fuse, actually. But there is another phenomenon called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle and Quantum Tunneling. Well, it turns out that these subatomic particles are not static. They're actually going all over the place, and they're also teleporting in and out of reality. Now, take that statement with a grain of salt, um, but you know it, it might help you understand a little bit of what's going on here. Uh, the photon is actually disappearing from reality and then reappearing in another location. Isn't that bizarre? Well, as I said before, it turns out the uh, intense heat and pressure at the core of the sun is not sufficient. It's not sufficient to get them close enough together, the nuclei of hydrogen, together in order to fuse them. But since they are teleporting, they're teleporting short distances, sometimes they're able to teleport on the other side of that electromagnetic repulsion barrier, and that brings them close enough to fuse. That gets them in range of the strong nuclear force and then they fuse. And they call that quantum tunneling. It's when a particle teleports through a physical barrier. It's really amazing. 
that this happens, but uh, it's true. It's 100% true. So anyway, um, yeah, that's fusion. So that's how fusion normally happens. Now, there is something called cold fusion. Now, there are two, like when we're talking about cold fusion, what does that mean? Does that mean fusion's happening at extremely cold temperatures? No, it just means that fusion is occurring at room temperature. It probably, it might be able to occur at uh, cold temperatures, but, you know, it, it's not, what I'm saying is, cold, like, the, the atmosphere or the temperature being cold is not required for the, the, the reaction to occur. It can just happen at, at any temperature. Um, now, there is uh, one accepted type of cold fusion called muon catalyzed fusion. And this is 100% accurate, and it can, it, it can happen. This is scientifically accepted. Basically, what you do is you use a particle called a muon, and this has exactly the same charge as an electron. It has a negative charge, but it's much bigger. It's much bigger. So what happens is, is that it actually comes in, and it knocks out an electron that's orbiting a hydrogen nuclei. And then, since it's so much bigger, it's actually blocking the electromagnetic force. And so, that since it's blocking it, it means that particles, these uh, hydrogen particles, can get closer together. Their nuclei, nuclei can get closer together. And it keeps them there long enough so that quantum tunneling can, can occur. Remember, quantum tunneling is a probability thing. So, uh, sometimes it'll happen, but the longer the long, if you were to hold the two nuclei together long enough, then the probability increases that quantum tunneling will, will occur. So, that's the basic idea. So, the, the muon will, will hold them together, hold the two nuclei, hydrogen nuclei, together long enough so that quantum tunneling can occur and then they fuse. And this is 100% accurate and it can happen. The problem is, well, there's two problems. Actually, there's a couple of problems. The biggest problem is something called alpha sticking, um, and also the the fact that um, muons don't don't survive. They don't live very long. Let's say uh, their lifetime is about 2.2 microseconds before they decay into other particles, and that's that's really really bad because that then it limits the amount of uh, uh, fusions that it can catalyze, right? But even if it was completely stable, there's the problem with alpha sticking. And what alpha sticking is, is that when fusion occurs, uh, helium, helium ions are produced, and these are called alpha particles. And occasionally, the negatively charged muon will stick to these helium ions, and then these helium ions have tremendous amounts of energy, and it just zips out of the, the reaction, and then it carries away the the muon, so they can't catalyze any more fusion reactions. So even if it was completely stable, the muon, it, it's, it's, the alpha sticking problem is limiting the amount of uh, fusion reactions it can catalyze. And that's, uh, that's the major problem. The other problem is the, the manufacture of muons in the first place. In order to make muons, you need to have a particle accelerator. And you're putting more energy into that particle accelerator than you are getting out of the fusion reactions that's catalyzing. And so that's uh, that's why we don't... that's why muon catalyzed fusion is not a way of uh, sustainable fusion energy. It just uh, won't work because we haven't reached break-even, the point of where you're putting as much energy into the reaction as you are getting out of it. So the second method, and this is actually where the, the term cold fusion became popularized. It was done by an experiment by, uh, with two che chemists. They weren't even physicists, they were chemists. And uh, I believe their names were Fletchman and Pons, I think. Stanley Pons and Martin Fletchman, I think. I think, let me, let me, see, let me check my notes. Uh, Martin Fletchman and Stanley Pons, yeah. So, uh, before we get into that, let's talk about electrolysis. Well, it turns out that you can separate hydrogen and oxygen out from water by running an electric current through it. You just need to have two electrodes, a cathode and an anode, 
and then they're electrically conductive and then you just have it in a solution of water that's conductive it has to be conductive so you probably uh, dissolve some kind of uh, um, conductive uh, electrolytes in there and then uh, you just run an electric current through it and then uh, hydrogen begins to bubble near the cathode while oxygen begins to bubble near the anode and so that separates out the the hydrogen and oxygen and you can extract hydrogen from regular old water um, yeah. now what uh, Fletchman and Pons were trying to do now this is cold fusion when you think when you when people say cold fusion this is actually what they're talking about this experiment what they tried to do was instead of using an ordinary cathode they used a cathode made out of palladium which is conductive but palladium has, an, a, un, has a unique ability to absorb hydrogen it's a very bizarre uh, characteristic of it well they thought well if it could do this maybe it could absorb hydrogen or in this case an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium into it at a concentration so high that it would cause quantum tunneling to occur and then fusion will occur so that's what they did they basically just made an electrolysis machine hooked it up to like a car battery or some kind of simple energy source but they used a cathode made out of palladium and then they turned on the power and what they saw was that the palladium melted very quickly and well actually no not very quickly they turned it on for a while and then eventually it began to melt and they thought well this must be nuclear fusion and that's what they thought they had fusion occurring at normal room temperature cold fusion that's where the term became popularized the problem was it was bogus they published their results in you know in the media and i think they published it in uh, a scientific journal but when it came, when it was done to peer, peer review and other people were trying to replicate the experiment they weren't successful you know there was no detection like you can you can know if fusion is occurring if there's a substantial amount of neutrons being emitted right from deuterium fusion and all of the attempts at replicating could not find any any meaningful uh, emission of neutrons so eventually it was determined that cold fusion was completely bunk and whatever the fuck was happening it was it was maybe just some kind of normal chemical reaction that was going on in the experiment that Fletchman and Pons were doing but it was not fusion and so cold fusion kind of went the way of the the dodo bird you know it just it just failed like that which is too bad um i i guess i should talk about bubble fusion a little bit um it's not technically cold fusion even though it does occur at room temperature locally what's happening is in fact hot fusion the idea is that if you acu acoustically stimulate do heavy water which is basically just regular water except instead of hydrogen you have deuterium uh... it will cause cavitation it will cause bubbles to to form and then these bubbles will rapidly collapse in it in itself and that releases tremendous amounts of heat and it's thought that in this heat that's generated so suddenly it could cause fusion the, the intense heat and pressure could could catalyze fusion. Uh, I believe that was that experiment was headed by a guy named Tekelarian or some shit like that. He's an Indian guy, but um, that also kind of suffered the same fate as cold fusion. Um, the attempts to replicate that experiment were just never successful. They were never able to replicate it under under this under the specified conditions that they said that that it requires. Um, so bubble fusion uh, also suffered the same fate as cold fusion. Uh, they also call that sono fusion or sonoluminescence. Yeah, so that's not to say that bubble fusion is impossible. It's just it hasn't been. No one's ever done it yet, and the attempt, the guy who claimed that he did it, the attempts at replicating that experiment were not successful. So what is the most probable method of achieving fusion right now.
Uh, right now, it's to use traditional hot fusion methods.